Good morning. Thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning together. Just a bunch of nobodies coming together to exalt somebody. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1. We're finished with Peter now, and we're moving into a study of the Gospel according to Mark. Actually, in reality, we haven't finished with Peter at all, um, because what you have in your hands before you open on your lap is the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Peter, as recorded by Mark, John Mark to be exact. Who is John Mark? Well, if you put your finger in Mark chapter 1 and turn to the book of Acts, I want to run down a little bit of the history on John Mark. So go ahead and turn to um, Acts chapter 12, verse 11. Now there's a pretty good chance that Mark grew up in a wealthy home. Um, he was a Gentile, a Roman. The first part of Acts chapter 12, we have um, Peter in prison for preaching. James has already been killed uh, in prison by Nero, or, yeah, by Herod. And in the middle of the night, an angel comes and frees Peter from jail. He literally comes into Peter's cell. He's chained between two guards, and the chains fall off. The guards don't wake up. And the angel escorts Peter out of jail. The doors open before them. Nobody wakes up. Nobody's wise to it. And the whole event was so surreal to Peter that he wasn't sure if it was real or not. And that's where we pick it up in verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And he knocked at the door, and you know the rest of the story. So the young man whose mother's name was Mary and owned a house that was big enough to accommodate the congregation of Christians there in Jerusalem. And you'd see in the next verse, a servant comes to the door. They were wealthy enough to have servants. That's John Mark. That's the Mark who wrote this book. Now, during the time that that's happening in Acts chapter 12, we see that Paul and Barnabas were traveling around, spreading the gospel, if you look down in chapter 12 of Acts at verse 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. So Paul and Barnabas had left Antioch, gone to Jerusalem with apparently a love gift for the Christians who were suffering persecution in, in Jerusalem. And then they returned to Antioch, but they brought John Mark with them. And, and Colossians... Chapter 4 tells us that this John Mark was actually Barnabas' cousin. They were related. Well, as we continue on through the book of Acts, in chapter 13, in verse 4, it says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. That's John Mark. And then, if you read on, you would see that they traveled on from Salamis to Paphos. So we pick them up in chapter 13, verse 13. It says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. That's on the mainland. And John left them there and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, a different Antioch. Now, we're not told at this point why Mark left. But we do know that it didn't sit well with Paul. Turn over to chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and verse 30. <clears throat> we see that Paul and Barnabas are back in Antioch. And verse 36, it says, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Good idea. 
Paul wanted to retra retrace their steps of the first missionary journey and follow up on these believers. Verse 36. Or excuse me, verse 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had left them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we never actually really get a clear explanation as to why Mark left. Some scholars believe he left because he was homesick. Others say maybe he really was sick. Maybe he had some physical illness. But most scholars think that he left simply because he feared the hardships of missionary life and he didn't want to do it anymore. Cyprus had been a hard experience. There was demon possession and opposition and, and maybe he just had had his fill. But whatever the reason for John Mark's leaving, Paul wasn't very happy about it. So he refuses to take him on this second trip. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, on the other hand, he was um, unwilling to give up on his young cousin. He was the one who had recommended him to missionary service in the first place, and so he leaves with John Mark to go do something else. Now, over time, we know that Paul changed his mind, and he forgave John Mark. In, first, or excuse me, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says, Only Luke is with me. He's talking to Timothy. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. He is helpful to me in my ministry. That indicates that Paul and Mark had been working together over the years, off and on, and Paul recognizes that Mark has grown up and has proved himself to be responsible and useful in the work. Now, of course, God never gave up on Mark. God had great things in mind for Mark. God did not allow Mark's failure to define him for the rest of his life. In fact, God would use Mark, the same Mark who's accused by many of being weak and timid and spoiled and a quitter, a guy who Paul at one time would have called a loser. That's the guy God chooses to write the gospel down for the very first time, the gospel of Mark. So go ahead and turn back there. Mark chapter 1. Now as we go along, you'll notice that Mark never identifies himself as the author of this book. But we know from the early church fathers that Mark ended up spending a lot of his time in his spiritual formation with Peter, in Peter's work through Asia Minor and other places. Papias, who lived in the first century, a church historian, wrote, quote, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately though not indeed in order whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. And if you read the writings of Eusebius and Irenaeus, you see that they agree with that assessment, that this book was clearly written by John Mark, the John Mark mentioned in Acts that we just saw. Now Mark, this Mark, the author of this book, would eventually go on to North Africa, to Egypt. And he would plant the church in Alexandria, and then in 68 AD, on Easter Sunday, according to church tradition, he would be martyred. He was dragged behind horses until he died there in Alexandria. But his ministry lives on. And so we will have the pleasure of sitting under the ministry and the teaching of Mark for the next several months. And I mean several months. We're going to be here for a year and a half um, through, Lord willing, May of 2020. And our passage this morning is in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. So if you want to look at that, we'll read it together. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. 
And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, a strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, you will notice right away that Mark doesn't drag his feet through a whole bunch of details as he recounts this story. He says nothing about himself. He says nothing about John the Baptist's parents, nothing about John's birth, nothing about Jesus' parents, nothing about Jesus' birth. In fact, he gets right to an Old Testament prophecy that John was coming, as though Mark has some important point he needs to make and he's not going to waste any time with it. And we're going to notice that throughout this entire gospel, this book moves very quickly. Mark wasn't writing a biography. He's making a proclamation. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And he is, in fact, the Son of God. Now, Mark's is the first gospel that was written down. Until now, the truths of the events that had happened during the lifetime of Christ were simply recounted among Christians and memorized by Christians and passed along orally throughout the Mediterranean world. But many scholars believe that Mark wrote this down maybe because of Peter and Paul and what happened to them. A lot of scholars believe that this was written in 65, 66 A.D., shortly after Paul and Peter were martyred in Rome. And that John Mark himself was in Rome when he wrote this, and that he wrote it to Christians in Rome. You know, some people wonder why the Gospels all have such different details. I think the answer is pretty simple. You have four different guys recounting the same story from four different perspectives, and they're writing to four different audiences. Think of Matthew. He's a Jew writing to Jews. You got Luke, he's a Greek physician writing to Greeks. John, who's just a plain old guy writing to working people who will ever listen to him. And then we have Mark, a Roman writing to Romans. Now, Mark wasn't just writing to Romans. I think it's pretty clear that Mark was writing to Christians in Rome who were under severe persecution from Nero. Nero had burned Rome in 64 AD. Most people understand that Nero was the one who set the fire, but he blamed the Christians. And as a result, he began to persecute the Christians. Tacitus, who was a Roman historian at the time, in the first century wrote this, quote, first Nero had the self-acknowledged Christians arrested, those Christians who would admit they were Christians. He had them arrested. Then on, their information, large numbers of others were condemned. Not so much for arson as for their antisocial tendencies. Now, just a word of explanation. The Christians weren't antisocial, but they did refuse to join in the festivities and the celebrations that would venerate Caesar as God, and so the Christians refused to do that, and they were seen as antisocial. Tacitus goes on. Their deaths were made farcical. Dressed in wild animal skins, they were torn to pieces by dogs, or crucified, or made into torches to be ignited after dark as substitutes for daylight daylight in Nero's gardens. And so this persecution from Nero drove the church in Rome underground. And it's very likely that it's in this context that Mark wrote the gospel account, this gospel account. So I want you to imagine... It's the Lord's Day, and you're in the catacombs with your brothers and sisters to lift up the name of Christ on Resurrection Day, every Sunday. And one Sunday, your pastor comes in, and he has a brand new document. And he said, I just received this from our brother Mark, and I want to read it to you. And he begins to read. But instead of going over all the accounts that you had memorized as a child, of John's parents and John's birth and Jesus' parents and Jesus' birth and the shepherds and and the manger and all that. Instead of going over all of that, he just begins with John in the desert, baptizing. And then it moves very quickly. Now, not only does the book start fast, the entire thing moves fast. Mark uses the word immediately, or some versions render it at once. He uses that phrase 42 times in this gospel. That phrase, immediately or at once, is only used 12 other times in the New Testament. Mark uses it 42 times. He's not a biographer. He's a storyteller. 
And he is determined to keep this story moving for those people down in the catacombs. Now, as we move along, you'll notice that Mark tells a whole lot more about what Jesus did than what Jesus said. If you were to look at the book of Mark as a play, I think you would find that there were three acts to this play. After the initial introduction, the first 13 verses, what Joel and I are treating um, this morning and next week, then we have three acts. Act one is Jesus' ministry in and around Galilee. That's in chapter one, if you're writing it down. Chapter one, verse 14, and goes all the way through chapter eight, verse 21. That's act one, Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Act two, that's set on the road to Jerusalem. Jesus going up to Jerusalem for the last week of his life. And that's chapter 8, verse 22, all the way through chapter 10. And then the last six chapters of the book would be Act chapter 3, and that's Jesus in Jerusalem for the Passion Week. Acts, or, um, Mark chapter 11 begins with um, the triumphal entry, and chapter 16 is the resurrection. So one-third of the entire book is dedicated to the Passion Week of Christ. It's not a biography. Now some people wonder, why did the Gospel writers wait so late? If this actually is 65 AD, why did they wait so long to write down the Gospel story instead of just passing it verbally to their children? Now remember, when Jesus left, he told his disciples, I'm coming back. And they expected it to be very soon, as all Christians should. We should expect his, his return to be imminent. But by the time 30 years had passed, James was gone. And now Peter and Paul had been martyred. And now Mark had watched many of his brothers and sisters murdered, martyred in Rome. And you know what he's thinking? If the Lord tarries, it's already been 30 years the people who were the eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus Christ are dying. I better write this down, just in case the Lord delays. Now, of course, that's the human explanation. You and I need to remember what we just studied in 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter 1.21, God said this, No prophecy of Scripture was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Mark did not write this when he wrote it, in the situation that he was in because of his own will. God carried him along and had him do it. God used the historical events, the context that Mark was in, to prompt Mark to write this book exactly when and where God wanted it written for his purpose. So go ahead and look at verse 1. We'll get started. Mark writes, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The good news. What is the good news? Well, Mark says the good news is that Jesus is in fact the Christ. He is in fact the Messiah, and he is in fact the Son of God, God himself. I think Mark is intent on proving those two points, that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, that have to do with Messiah. Jesus is the one who fulfills all those. And it climaxes actually in chapter 8, if you remember, in, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked the disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. And then in Mark chapter 15, after Jesus died, the centurion, the Gentile centurion, is standing there next to the cross. And he says, truly this man was the Son of God. And I think those two proclamations, chapter 8 and chapter 15, as well as this Beginning proclamation in verse 1, chapter 1, sets the theme for the entire book. In verse 2 here, in Mark, chapter 1, he takes us immediately to the Old Testament prophecy. Mark wants us to see that Jesus is the joyous fulfillment of everything that the prophet said about Messiah. He's here. He is the one. Verse 2, it says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now that's actually a composite of three Old Testament passages. Exodus chapter 23, Malachi 3, and then Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. 
the Old Testament makes it very clear Messiah is coming. And the Old Testament builds, the, the nation of Israel builds their expectation for Messiah's eventual arrival. But they also proclaim that a herald would come in advance of Messiah and he would prepare the way for Jesus, for the Messiah. Now remember, the Old Testament ended 430 years before John the Baptist was born. With Malachi and Nehemiah, that's where the Old Testament ends. God got so fed up with Israel that he just shut up and stopped talking. He gave a promise right at the end of Malachi, and then he said, no more. And then in Luke chapter 1, it's pretty cool, an angel of the Lord appears to a priest named Zechariah, and he says, you're going to have a son. I want you to name him John. 430 years of silence. Not a peep from God. And then God says, John's the one through whom I'm going to speak first. John's not going to be the Messiah. But John most definitely would be sent by God to announce the coming of Messiah. Now you can only imagine the stir that John made when he showed up. The first prophet in four centuries to come, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Look at verse 4. Mark says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. I love the way Mark, John, he just, boom, John appears. John appeared. Again, no mention of his parents, no mention of his background. He he just appears, and he's there. Now, from what we know from the Gospel of John, we know where John the Baptist was actually baptizing. He was baptizing, he was actually based east of the Jordan, out in the desert, just north of the Sea of Galilee. That's a place that's very close to Jericho, on the opposite side of the river from Jericho. How well do you remember your Old Testament history? 2 Kings chapter 2, we find out that that's the same place opposite Jericho on the east side of the Jordan where God came and took up Elijah with the, with the flaming chariots. So you have John in the wilderness, like the prophets of old. They were always in the wilderness. Preaching a message of repentance, like the prophets of old. They were always preaching to Israel and Judah wearing animal skins and eating off the land like many of the prophets of old. And he shows up right exactly in the same place where Elijah disappeared. (laughs) I mean, you can see why John became an instant celebrity. And it says that all of Judea and all of Jerusalem came flocking to him out there in, in the desert. Do you remember what the last words of the Old Testament were? Let's go ahead and look at them. Malachi chapter 4. Now, we're going to be doing a lot of page turning this morning. We're going to read a whole bunch of supporting scriptures. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 5, right there at the end of the Old Testament. God says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of their utter destruction. Everyone was expecting Elijah to return, and suddenly John shows up in just the right place, looking exactly like you would expect. Of course, we know that John was not a reincarnation of of Elijah, right? But he is the fulfillment of the prophecy In Malachi chapter 4. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. I alluded to it earlier. Luke chapter 1. In verse 11 of Luke chapter 1, the Holy Spirit starts explaining some things for us. Luke 1 11. And there appeared to him, to Zechariah, who was in the temple doing his priestly service, 
And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So this is in the holy place, not the holy of holies, in the holy place. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be, the, will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn, get this, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So this is John, who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And Jesus confirms this. I just want to make sure that we understand. This is con- confirmed. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 11. Sword drills this morning. Matthew 11. I know who's going to win. Matthew 11. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds. This is verse 7, Matthew 11, verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Well, they must have said no, because what, what, did, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothing? Behold, those who wear fine clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has, ar- there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John... And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus himself clarifies for us that, in fact, John the Baptist fulfills the prophecy of the Old Testament concerning the forerunner who would come and prepare the way for Messiah. And what was John's mission when he got here? Well, we're told in Mark 1, verse 4, it says he came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a sermon of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Then in verses 7 and 8, let's go ahead and read it. Mark 1. It says, And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism was nothing new for John. It wasn't anything new for the Jews. Um, by that time, there were rabbis who were baptizing people. Not all rapt- rabbis, but there were some rabbis who would come and baptize Gentiles who wanted to become Jews, proselytes. So it wasn't anything new, but it was always Gentiles. What is new for John is that John's preaching to Israelites. He's preaching to the Jews, and he's demanding baptism for Jews, as though they're outside and need to be brought in, demanding that Jews seek forgiveness. John's message is very clear. There will be no hiding behind Abraham when it comes to salvation. There's no no national salvation that can be claimed. No, in fact, everyone would have to come before Messiah and repent before Messiah and seek forgiveness from Messiah. And John says here in verse 7 that Messiah is mighty. And then in verse 8 he says that he will come and he will baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Clearly this Messiah is God. Now Mark already said that back in verse 1. Go ahead and look up Mark chapter 1 verse 1. There, Mark said that that, uh, this Christ would be the Son of God. The Son of God, not a Son of God. To the Jewish mind that was a very clear claim to deity. Go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 5. 
I want you to see this with your own eyes. In John chapter 5, Jesus healed the lame man, and he did it on the Sabbath, I guess to poke the Pharisees in the eye, I don't know. And Jesus tells this guy, take up your mat and walk, go home. So we pick up the story in verse 10. So the guy's been healed. He's been seen walking around with his mat under his arm. So the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, verse 10, it's the Sabbath, and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, well, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Verse 13, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. My father is working until now, and I am working. That's why the Jews, verse 18, that's why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he wasn't only breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So in the Gospels, when they call Jesus the Son of God, that's an obvious declaration that Jesus is God in the flesh. And Mark says in verse 8 that this Messiah would come and baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Well, only God does that. Only God can baptize people with the Holy Spirit. In Joel, where the prophecy of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was made, Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, it says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I, I, God speaking, I will pour out my Spirit. God does that. So what is John or what is Mark saying here in verses 7 and 8? Well, he's saying to all these people who were coming out to him beyond the Jordan, don't look at me. The one who's coming after me, he's the one you need to get excited about. He's God. He's the Messiah. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. I'm just baptizing you with water. But when he gets here, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What a promise. This isn't going to be a symbolic baptism like what the Jews were doing. It's not going to be a symbolic baptism like what John was actually doing. No, this is going to be the real thing, where God will pour out his Holy Spirit from on high and wash over human beings. So what does that look like? To be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? I think I need to spend a little bit of time on this. I feel like this is an area of confusion and has been for centuries, but especially in the last 50 years here in America, this is a very confusing topic. There are some Christians who will teach you that you can be a Christian, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, going to heaven, Christian, and still not have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. That as a Christian... At some subsequent point, you need to go out and seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you do get baptized, then you'll be a special Christian. You'll be a first-class Christian. Normal Christians are here. Christians who've been baptized in the Spirit are up here. And most of these teachers are going to tell you that when you'll know when you've been baptized because you'll start speaking in tongues. Now, the only problem with that teaching is it's not found in the Bible. I don't have enough time this morning to completely dissect all of the points on this, but let me just make a few points here. First of all, it is impossible to be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And you really need to turn there and see this. And if you don't have your Bible this morning, write this down and go look at it. It is so important that we understand this. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us life. Without the Holy Spirit, you're still dead in your sins. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Paul writes, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. I'm going to read that again. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. 
But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12, I'm going to keep going because it's really important. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Galatians 2.20 pops up right there. Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You see, when you're born again by God, it is the Spirit of God poured out from God that saves us and gives us new life. In John chapter 3, when Jesus was talking about these things with Nicodemus, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again by the Spirit. You can't be a Christian without the Spirit. Now, I've gone through this with people, and I've said all these things to people before, and they still come back and insist that, no, it, you, it's possible to have the Spirit and still not have been baptized by the Spirit. Well, there's only one problem with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you would please turn there. I want you to see it with your own eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. I realize this is more of a Bible study this morning than a sermon, but I really want you to see these things with your own eyes. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. In chapter 12, Paul is explaining that we as the body of Christ are very much like a body. And there are many parts, just as you have a hand and a foot and a nose and a mouth. The, the church is the same way. And in verse 12, Paul says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Verse 13. For with one spirit we were all baptized into one body. All y'all, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. All. You can't be in the body of Christ unless you were baptized in the body of Christ. And if you haven't been baptized in the body of Christ, you're not in the body of Christ and you're on your way to hell. That's the gospel message. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4, Paul said to Titus, But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but in virtue of his own mercy, get this, by the washing of of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Holy Spirit was poured on us in a, in a real baptism. The water baptism we do up here and the water baptism that John was doing are symbols of the reality. If anybody ever asks you, does baptism say, save you, say absolutely, baptism saves us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved. It happened the very instant that you gave your life to Christ. And the power of God washed over you and washed you from all your sins. And the power of God made you part of the body of Christ. And the power of God made you a new creation. When you got saved, you didn't just change your mind about Jesus. When you got saved, a miracle from on high came down upon you and you became a new creation. And he came to dwell in you. And that's what Mark is proclaiming here in verse 8. He's talking directly about salvation. Salvation that comes through the spread of the gospel. And that's what Mark's all about, spreading the gospel. Now, before I finish, I just want to point out that these opening verses all the way through verse 13, are set in the wilderness. Verse 3 prophesies of the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Verse 4 says that John appeared in the wilderness proclaiming the coming Christ. 
And then next week we'll see in verse 12 that the Holy Spirit, after the baptism of Christ, drives Jesus out into the desert wilderness. Now, I don't know if Mark emphasizes this theme because he's talking to people who are homeless and destitute, running away from Roman authorities, and so Mark wants to emphasize the theme of, of the wilderness. Maybe it's, I think it's possible. But I do know this, that throughout Scripture, God has made a habit of leading his people into the desert wilderness. Not for our harm, but to bless us. If you remember, after Moses, well, first of all, let's start with the people of Israel in, in Egypt. When they left Egypt, where did they go? God led them out into the desert to test them and to form them. If you're looking for a good passage to read sometime on this, read Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's so rich. It's a wonderful description of why God led the Israelites into the wilderness, into the desert, so that they would learn to lean on him, so that they would learn to pray to him and ask him for stuff, so they would learn that they could trust him and follow him and leave everything behind. Sadly, what the Israelites mostly did was grumble and complain. And God does the same thing for us to see if we will allow him to mold us in those tough places. After Moses killed a man, he was living as a fugitive out in the wilderness. He was a broken man. And it was there that God met him and gave him his call and equipped him to do the work that he had to do. And God does the same thing with you and I in our wilderness today. When Saul wanted to kill David and David had to flee, David ended up fleeing out into the desert wilderness. And it was there in that wilderness where David's heart was knit to the heart of God and he learned that he could trust God in everything. And he learned the humility that he was going to need to lead the people of Israel. And God does that with you and I today in our wilderness. After Paul got saved, where did he go? He went to Arabia, to the wilderness. And there, he learned the mind of God and the voice of Christ. The desert wilderness is a hard place. I mean, it is, it's full of snakes. It's full of, it's full of scorpions and wild beasts and, and scorching heat and no shade and no water. It's a place that will make you cry. Preferably, it's a place that will make us cry out to God and to seek him because he uses those places to draw us closer to his heart. I don't know what your desert place might be this morning, but I want to encourage you. Don't despair. These are places that God uses to bring us to the end of ourselves and into the fullness of his spirit, the fullness of his presence, the fullness of his sufficiency, where we come to the place where we realize I have nothing left and we realize that God is utterly and completely sufficient for everything that we need. And he will carry us. And he will carry you. It's not that he necessarily removes us immediately from the pain of the situation. But in the midst of the pain, he comes to us afresh. And that really is the treasure, isn't it? It's there that we discover again that he's completely sufficient. And that he really is the only thing that our hearts long for. If you're hurting and you're in some wilderness in your life this morning, I invite you to come along on this journey with us in the study of Mark. Study it with us. Read in advance. Pray about these things. Read the passage the week before and come in here on Sunday morning prepared and ready to engage in whatever the person standing up here is saying because you've already studied it before. And I guarantee you, because God's word guarantees it, that he will meet you there in your wilderness and he will satisfy your real longing. Let's pray. Father, we need you. And, and, and every now and then we get glimpses that we do. And we realize buying that bangle or, or that gadget isn't going to be the thing that satisfies us. You are the only thing that will do that. We invite you to do that for us, Lord, in these tough places in life. Carry us in your grace. Carry us in your love. We ask you to do that in Jesus' name.